Welcome everybody. My name is Tim Sandy and I'm a senior systems engineer with Cohesity. In this video, I'm going to go over just a very basic initial configuration from deployment of a single node Cohesity cluster. Now, in a real world production environment, obviously, we're going to require that you have three or more Cohesity nodes to consist of your initial cluster. However, this is just a demo environment, uh, just to do a simple, a basic overview of some initial configurations of your Cohesity cluster. In my environment, I'm setting up, this is my second one, hence why it's named Cluster 02. I've deployed the virtual machine because it is a virtual edition cluster. Again, this is just for a demo environment. So keep in mind, in a real production world, it would be physical nodes, minimum of three or more, be a slightly different architecture, obviously, and configurations would be um, a little bit more entailed. But again, this is just going to be a very basic configuration overview. I have already have one virtual node deployed as a cluster. I'm deploying the second one, naming it cluster 02. The first one that I've already got deployed is cluster 01. So I've deployed the virtual machine, that particular node, and I'm going to log in. Initially, it is admin admin. And when you see here, when you log in, it brings you directly to our dashboard. Again, because this was just deployed, obviously we got zeros across the dashboard for all the information. Now, one of the first things that we're going to want to do, there's numerous things, but first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the protection tab here and we're going to go to sources. I'm going to um, first register my VMware environment, so my vCenter server. Now here, as you can see, when you go to register your source, you're going to select what kind of source is a standalone ESX host, a vCenter server, Hyper-V, SV, uh, excuse me, SCVMM server, Acropolis hypervisor, uh, some uh, maybe AWS or Azure or Red Hat. So depending on your hypervisor of choice, uh, you're going to select that. In my case, I'm going to select vCenter server. I'm going to go ahead and put in my vCenter server IP address. I'm going to use the administrator at vSphere.local, username for my vCenter, and the associated password. You have some options here as far as CA certificate, latency based. Uh, throttling, so on and so forth. But for again, for this basic install and configuration, we're just going to leave all the default settings and we're going to go ahead and register it. As you can see, it gives us status that the registration was successful at the top. So we now have my vCenter server registered and the information associated to it. As you can see here, as we go through and do some of the configurations, you're going to have this radio button here where you have multiple options, whether you're creating a protection group, adding a source, what have you. But this is where you're going to be to make some modifications. So we need to go and edit it, unregister it if we want to automatically protect it. Um, here's the options for that. So now we've registered the vCenter server. So now we're going to be able to pull in all that information from the vCenter to see all our hosts and all our virtual machines. Under protection again, I'm going to, since this is the cluster 02 and I have a cluster 01, I'm going to go ahead and register that now with my cluster 01. So I'm going to add the cluster. I'm going to add the IP address of the first one. Of course, the login information. And for the interface settings, I'm just going to let it go to auto select and click connect. As you can see, connection was validated. Cluster options, uh, you can set remote access as well as replication. So from a replication standpoint, you know what, let's hold off for that right now. Let's skip the replication. We're going to click Create. So we now have the remote cluster of cluster 01. We have remote access to it, but we have replication turned off. So if you had other clusters, you can go ahead and add them here. Now, if we were going to also connect to any cloud providers, such as AWS, GCP, or Azure, 
for targets, here's where we can register those external targets. Now, I'm not going to do that in this example here, but uh, is a purpose for archival or tiering? You can select, obviously, your different um, external targets. Now, I mentioned cloud providers, but besides that, it can also be a NAS. It can be QSTAR tape system. It can also be S3 compatible as well. So we can add that, but we're not going to do that in this example, as I said before. Now, let's go ahead and um, we are going to uh, go to the platform and we're going to go to the cluster. OK, so we have an issue uh, cluster here and we're going to go ahead and click configure. All this information should be in here as it was from our initial deployment of the virtual machine. In my particular case, again, in the real world, it's going to be a physical node. So during that deployment, you'd put that information. So that's good to go. You also have storage domains. OK, by default, we have the default storage domain. You can add additional storage domains as needed. This shows our nodes. So again, I am using a single virtual node. Uh, in the real world, you'd have three or more physical servers here. Uh, if you have VLANs configured, go there also as well as KMS. It, we have the native ability to encrypt all of our data. One thing to note though, if you ever turn on encryption, once you turn that on, that, there's no going back. You can't turn it off. So keep that in mind, be very careful if you're going to be turning on encryption. But getting back to the point here, we have built in SafeNet encryption as our KMS server. However, if your environment already has an external KMS KMIP server, uh, such as maybe HITRUST, for example, you can point to that external existing KMIP server. And here's where you would go ahead and configure that. But again, we're not going to do that in this instance. Next up is after the cluster is done, views would be next. Right now we do not have a view, so we can go ahead and create a view. And I'm just gonna call this default view dash O2. You can override your storage domain policy. Again, a view is within a storage domain. If you've looked at any of our older documentation, a storage domain is kind of our new name for it. It used to be called a view box. Then above that is the cluster slash partition level from the file system perspective. Normally, by default, we recommend doing uh, test dev high for the QS policy. As you can see here, uh, we have some advanced policy settings. Um, you can get very specific. You can do uh, for different protocols. You can do NFS, SMB, S3. So you can do them individually. So when you're creating your different views, you can have multiple views within a storage domain. You can have multiple storage domains within a cluster. If it's very specific, best practice is if it's strictly going to be NFS only, then you want to select this specific protocol. If you're kind of not sure and you may be using different protocols, then you would select the all. So for my general purpose of this lab, I'm going to keep it the protocols at all. You have options for SMB shares. Are they browsable? Uh, you can access based enumeration for SMB. Again, you're tying to Active Directory. Security style, native, unified NTFS. File system, is a case insensitive? Or is it? do you want it to be sensitive? File filtering, data lock. Data lock is when we can, once a protection job is created, a backup is done, that data is locked. So it protects it from things like ransomware. That data cannot be modified. So from a compliance standpoint, if you have some sort of compliance requirements to where it's read-only data and that it cannot be modified and people can only view it, uh, and search for it and view it, but not change it or write to it, then that's what data lock is for. You can also put quotas and alerts for the quotas. You can also do a global whitelist as well. So we're gonna go ahead and just and keep this basic setting here and create the view. Created the storage domain, we've created the view. We're good to go with that basic configuration. 
Now going over to admin, we've already looked at the cluster settings already. If you want it, if you needed to upgrade it, obviously we could go to the upgrade center here. Uh, but right now we're not going to do any upgrade. Again, I'm working on version 6.1.1F, which is our long-term supported version right now. However, there are newer versions out there that just aren't classified as our long-term supported versions. Going back to admin, we would want to go to access management. So here's where we can add Active Directory. So I'm going to go ahead and join a domain. So now I filled out the pertinent information. We start off with the domain name, then we put in the username. And as it specifies in the example here, it can be username or username at domain.com. Uh, password. OU, you don't have to put the OU if you just wanted to search from the root of the Active Directory uh, file uh, OU structure, then you can leave it blank, which is what I did here. You can also put in a work group or net BIOS name if appropriate. And then of course the particular VM, in my case, single node VM, the name of it is cluster O2. So that's already filled in. I've already created an Active Directory account in my OU structure. So I'm gonna say use my existing machine counts. If you haven't, just leave that uh, undone by unselecting, it'll be unselected by default. So simply click add Active Directory. And as you can see very quickly, it added the Active Directory information. So now that we've added Active Directory, you can see going over to the roles tab here, we have some roles. Now the main thing I wanna point out, as you can see, all the roles have descriptions. The, the two important distinctions that I wanna make though in these is the admin is basically can do everything with the exception of one thing. As it says here, except for changes to data lock views. So I mentioned data lock views before. When you data lock it, it's read only. Now, when it does that, an administrator in this role or, you know, the admin role in the Cohesity environment does not have access for searching the data locked information. However, the data security role does. So typically the data security role is going to be given to your SSO, your security officer of your environment. Data security role is really kind of that super admin. And the admin's everything but being able to to do anything to the data lock views. I'm gonna go ahead and in this case, being a demo environment, I'm going to click on that and it's a breakdown of what they can do. However, what I'm gonna do is now that I've connected to Active Directory, as you can see, the admin has everything but source access control. Basically that is for the data lock views. So I'm gonna to go to users and groups And I'm going to add from Active Directory. I'm going to search for domain admins and select it. And then I'm going to select the role. Now, being a demo environment, so I'm going to add them to the admin group. I'm not going to restrict them to specific objects for any reason. I'm going to click add. So now everybody in my Active Directory domain admins group now is an admin in our environment. Then access management, we also, if you want to set up LDAP for Linux, uh, you can go here as well as single sign on here, but we're not going to do that in this case. So now let's go over and look at protection tab and let's go to policy manager. As you can see here, default out of the box, we have created a gold, silver, and bronze policy. As you can see, gold has a backup every four hours, retention for seven days. Silver has backup every 12 hours, retention is 14 days. Bronze is backup daily, retention 30 days. Now these are default. Now keep in mind, I remember what I said, you can go to the radius button here and uh, is where your options are. So from these default policies that we have in the policy manager, we can copy a policy and modify it. We can edit the existing policy, or we can obviously delete it. So just to show as an example, I'm going to say that let's take the bronze. I want to create something that's, I'm going to call it a copper policy. So we're going to 
copy that policy. We're going to change the name. We're going to call it copper. Okay. And we're going to say that it's going to be every week on Sunday. And we're going to retain for 30 days. Okay. We're going to do incremental with a full with a full uh, once a week. And we're going to do that on Saturday, let's say. If this was like a SQL database or some sort of database, we want to add log backups, we could do that. If we're doing a bare metal restore on a physical server, here's where we can set that. Here's for extended uh, retention period. We can modify that. Or retry options, blackout windows. So if you want to say um, we could go through and add, um, and I'm just going to do it once here. I'll keep it on Thursday for now, but we're going to do it a week. So from, let's say from 6 o'clock in the morning until... Nine PM at night is a is a blackout window, okay? Because there's a particular job that's running or something. Uh, if now that you know again in this demo environment they have this is cluster O2. I've got cluster O1. We set up uh, the source to cluster O1. We could replicate. So if we wanted to back up something here and replicate it to cluster O1, we could do that. Do it for archival. Cloud spin is again where we're able to use a cloud environment such as AWS Azure or GCP to send our backup jobs to the cloud and then we can spin them up with instant restores. So that's what cloud spin is, just very briefly. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create that. So now we have this copper policy, which is backup weekly retained for 30 days. So that was under the policy manager. Let's go to protection jobs. So let's, we're, there are no protection jobs again, because this is fresh out of the box. So let's go ahead and create a protection job. As you can see here, we can protect a virtual server, a physical server, both file-based and block-based. We can do one of our, an entire view. We can do a SQL server, Oracle database, remote adapter, pure storage volume, or a NAS. So we're just going to do virtual server, and we're going to connect the source to the virtual center. We're going to open this up and expand it down. I've got a single host here with all of these VMs in here. So just for uh, simplistic sake here, again, being a demo environment, I'm just going to grab this tiny VM. This is a very unimportant VM, and I'm going to go ahead and add that. Okay, so now we have this tiny VM2. I'm going to select the policy, and I'm going to select that new copper policy. It's going to be in the default storage domain. Now, as you can see here, we can modify the time that it's going to start. So I'm going to say it's going to be 1 a.m. in the morning and Eastern time. Uh, end day, never. Um, again, you can go down and modify the QS policy. Uh, Abort and blackouts, exclusions, app consistency backups, indexing. Uh, indexing is always enabled. Uh, cloud migration. Again, um, if we were going to want to send the backup copy of this VM out to one of those cloud environments to potentially spin up in a DR situation to do an instant restore, we could do that. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to name this... Um, Tiny VM to just uh, make it easy. Of course, it helps if I spell it right. And we're going to click protect. So now we have this protection job. We can go to this protection job. And again, we can pause future runs, edit it, delete the job, deactivate the protection job, or click run now. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, we're going to select being the first time it would be a full backup all objects in the job 
If we wanted to set it up for replication to do the copy or archiving, we'd do that here, but we're not. We're just going to go ahead and back up now, and we're going to let this run. Now, this should run pretty quick. Uh, it's a very small VM, obviously, by the name. I'm going to go ahead and pause until it finishes. As you can see here, it has started. And we can also go in and click right in on this. Oh, it just finished. So as we click in the details here, we can see here is the date that the backup was run. It met the SLAs that we set forward with the policy. It was successful. As you can see, you can edit the run here. You have an audit trail. You have settings for this. So here's the information. Statistics. So how many times it's run, successful errors and such. So we'll go back to the protection job. Okay, so I've finished successfully. Now I'm gonna go ahead and run it again. But this time what I wanna do is I wanna do an incremental. So I'm gonna keep that default and we're gonna go ahead and back up now. So this one should definitely run quick. We can click in here to get the details. As you can see, here's the full that had passed and now the incremental is running. As we see now, the incremental job has now uh, finished and was successful. So back to the, the protection job, as we can see here. Okay, now I just wanted to kind of show you how to register uh, something else, uh, such as an external NAS. Now, in my cluster 01 instance, I've already registered my SQL server, so I can't re-register that on the cluster 02. But just going over to my cluster 01 instance, I wanted to show you that if I go to the sources, you can see here that when, again, even though it's a virtual SQL server, I may pretend it was a physical SQL cluster, I registered it physical ser physical SQL cluster and then specifically the SQL server. So once I did that, uh, you're going to see that there's a SQL dashboard that I'll show you here shortly that will show you all the databases and the database server protection jobs and everything else. Also, you can see here where I registered a external NAS as well. I have an NFS share on that NAS and I've connected to that to where I can back up uh, and create protection jobs for that data on there as well. So uh, just to show you real quick with the MS SQL dashboard. Uh, as you can see here, I have one SQL host uh, with one instance of a SQL server with six databases that I have protected. And here it is right here. So here's the databases that I have protected and have run protection jobs against. So just wanted to show you that real quick. I can't redo it again on the cluster 02 that we were just on, but I wanted to show you in cluster 01. Now we went ahead and, and when we were in 02, we connected a remote cluster to 01. So now that I'm in 01, I'm going to go ahead and connect the other way. Okay, so I put in information for the cluster 02 instance to connect. And we're going to connect to that. As you can see, we connected. We're going to turn on remote access. And again, we're just going to leave replication off for now. That's something that we can do for later if we wanted to. Click create. So now basically both clusters are pointing to each other as remote clusters. One thing uh, I do want to show you going back to cluster 02 from initial configuration standpoint, uh, going to admin and then access management. Um, I had just, uh, when I made that connection, I went ahead, um, I paused the recording and did it. I should have just showed you, but in order to go in and change the information, um, you can either click on it and do the edit pencil here. This is where you can, you click on this to change the password. You do have to put in an email address. It can be fictional such as this or a real world one, but just to let you know, in order to do and make any edits to the default settings in an account, you do have to put an email address in there. So I just wanted to show you that real quick. And like I said, I went ahead and did that while I was on pause. Now, 
just to kind of show you real quick from a that's pretty much it for the initial configuration i want to show you but i want to show you the monitoring you have performance storage and alerts you can do reporting you can look at auto logs also perform advanced diagnostics uh, under the more tab we have test dev now this is going back to what i was saying before where let's say we're connected to aws and we have an s3 bucket and what we're wanting to do is uh, in a DR event, we want to store our backups out on S3, but then we have a DR event and we want to do an instant recovery of say 100 VMs. We can do that with our um, with our product. So basically, what we would do is um, you could spin that up. That was a cloud spin. But then what we also have is the clone feature, and I talked about this from a test dev standpoint. So hence why, again, it's test dev. We can clone uh, a production system, and they can work on that. But then I also want to show you the workbench here where there's also these internal tools. We have video compressors. So say if you're a company that stores a lot of videos, that eats up a lot of storage. Well, we have this tool that can compress those videos to help reduce the amount of storage that you're you're using, which can save you a lot of money. We also have the password detector. So for your SSO, your security officer, uh, if they want to do searches for weak passwords. And also we have the pattern finder, again, SSO function. So if your company has to meet certain compliance, such as PII for credit card, social security type information, you can do a pattern finder. You can clone that information, read only copy, um, and then you can go use the pattern finder to look for that type of information. This does take a little while to run. It's not a real quick thing because it's globally looking at all of it and doing um, that type of information because we do global indexing of all of our data and you can do global search against it. But this tool is specifically, again, for looking for that PI type of information. Um, just a future state mention here in our future releases our solution um, you're going to find under here too you're also going to have apps under the more section and we are now going to be able in the newer versions be able to run actually apps on our cohesity cluster so something like splunk for example maybe an antivirus tool we have some that are just like these tools here that are homegrown for like antivirus and and such capabilities as that but then there's going to be some other third-party apps as well and then that list is going to grow over time as well so instead of bringing your data to the apps which is very difficult and also it takes a big hit on your network and performance from a resource standpoint we're now bringing the application to the data the performance is much better and again uh, less tasking on your network as well as your actual resources doing all the computations so just wanted to bring that up as well to some of the other areas that were in the user interface so hopefully this gives you a, a very basic understanding of some of the initial configurations that you're going to do when you first stand up a cohesity cluster keep in mind again this is a very simple basic configuration also using our Cohesity Virtual Edition, which is a single node in the real world. You're going to be using physical Cohesity boxes and a minimum of three nodes. So it is going to look a little bit different from a configuration standpoint. But everything that I did in here, you will do in the real world as well. There just might be a couple more steps in a real production environment. So I hope this was helpful and you got a little better understanding of our user interface as well as how to initially configure a Cohesity cluster. Thank you and have a wonderful day.